Okay, um, so welcome everyone um, to our uh, Monash Cybersecurity uh, Seminar, the final one for 2022. And today I'm very happy to introduce uh, our speaker, which who is a uh, visiting professor at Monash, uh, Professor Ivo Desme. He's a distinguished professor at the University of Texas at Dallas. And um, now he's uh, a very uh, a very accomplished cryptographer and researcher in information security. He's received many awards, such as a fellowship of the International Association of Cryptologic Research. And he's also a member of the Belgium Royal Academy of Science. He received his PhD in 1984 from the University of Leuven, Belgium, and he, had, he held positions at the University of Montreal, University of Wisconsin-Milwaukee, um, Florida State University, and also he was BT Chair of Information Communication Technology at UCL in London, um, and uh, currently is is at the University of Texas at Dallas, and he's, he's also uh, Editor in chief of uh, a number of journals and international conferences, and he's authored over 200 uh, papers on a variety of topics in cryptography and computer security. Um, so you can read more about uh, Ivo's long uh, and accomplished achievements on the uh, website. So, but I'd like to let Ivo uh, tell us about uh, his research on, on secret sharing. So it's over to you, Ivo. Thank you. OK, thank you. I'm going to use my own microphone. Ah, yeah. So yeah. please turn that off, yeah. because otherwise things will be. OK, so I will tell you a little bit about aspects from secret sharing that we usually don't hear about. So I will talk about secret sharing, why it's important. Then I will give you some uh, background what, what's rational secret sharing. Then we're going to look at what we call realistic secret sharing. And we will explain how to model it. For those of you who don't know Shamir secret sharing scheme, I will please explain Shamir secret sharing scheme. Then I will give you a comment on Shamir secret sharing scheme. And then basically look at framing. And I will give you some references at the end. So, People usually think it's secret sharing that uh, this is invented by Blakely and Shamir. But that's actually not true. And I think it was actually what John who pointed out to me that if you read the original paper from Shamir, that he actually makes a reference to a book in combinatorics. Uh, and there, they are looking at it from a mechanical viewpoint. And so I spoke to many people about that. And so what I heard is that this was posed as a, a problem at the math Olympia. Uh, and so the solution is to use combinatorics. And so there, what happens if you have old fashioned keys, so you can only give copies of the keys and then you can put many locks. So on that door here, there's only one lock, which is not true because there is an old fashioned lock, but there is also the electronics here with which you can open the door. And in that case, you have an or. It's either the one or the other. So if you stay in a hotel, then what happens today is you have uh, a safe for putting your val valuables in, usually your laptop today. But actually, uh, what happens is that there is a hidden. There is something hidden. And if you move this hidden part, then you will see that you can put a mechanical uh, key in it. And so that's the way that if you forgot your password, then a manager of the hotel will come with the key and then open uh, the, your valve in your hotel. So there is an or. So that's basically all mechanical. You could say when you type in your password of the safe, that's actually an electronic one. Yes, but it doesn't use the properties of electronics. That was the first time was done by Blakely and Shamir, in which they compute with data. With keys, you cannot compute except in very basic operations on or and end. 
but uh, with data you can do more complex operations and so that made the solution much more efficient than the solution which is based on copying and making more locks so a single sharing scheme contains two algorithms one which will create shares from a secret and I write a secret as k most people write as s and we don't need to see that set S, I use K for keys, uh, which I'm not going to go into details. And you have N parties, they are in a, in a set P. And then you will have, if you are authorized, then you can regenerate the secret using a second algorithm. However, if you are not authorized, this is the, other, the, the set of uh, that list, which subsets of P are authorized, then you cannot. And so the, de the dealer generates the secret, the secret shares. Um, and so usually you also have a public uh, directory. The Van Stone and his co-authors were looking at avoiding this, but I'm not going to go in that aspect. So the, uh, yes, that's what I wanted to say. Oh, uh, one thing I wanted to say is that this is the old definition. We were actually talking about that yesterday. In the old definition, it is just that you cannot regenerate the secret. So that is not the same as it doesn't leak any information about the secret. And so if you look at Blakely's scheme, it satisfies this definition. But Shamir satisfies the stronger one. And in the stronger one, you basically have that if you look at uh, an unauthorized set of shares, so you have an authorized subset of participants, and then you look at their shares, that's going to be independent of the secret. If that's the case, it's called perfect. Okay. So this is called the access structure. It's different from access control in computer security, but I presume you all control efforts. So don't try to explain the difference with what happens in. Computer security, where access is done very differently than in crypto. So, why is secret sharing so important? Last time that I looked on the internet, Shamir's paper had 17,000 citations looking at Google's code. So, it's one of the most cited papers in computer science. But despite that, despite the fact there's so much research on it, it's rarely used in practice. And it's the foundation of a lot of theoretical schemes and protocols that are potentially practical, such as threshold crypto, secure multi party computation, unconditionally, uh, private and secure message transmission, and IBM's multi cloud. So now we're going to talk about rational secret sharing. So the study of rational secret sharing was initiated by Halpern and Fink. Uh, and one of these authors actually is at, uh, in Canberra at ANU. And they regard the construction of the secret as a game. And so they use game theory. Okay. And so it was shown that participant parties may refuse to reveal their shares, and so the reconstruction may fail. But what they show is that if you look from a game theory viewpoint, then the most logical that you can do, and they call that rational. So uh, in game theory, if you behave uh, in a way in which you use your brain, then you're called a rational player. And if you don't use your brain, you're an irrational player. Okay. So, and the most rational is to basically not reveal your share. And so reconstruction will then fail. And so the impact is huge because it means secure multi party computation. Parties may uh, refuse to execute the last step. And so the function is never computed. Okay. And so, what they actually then, as a consequence, is that secret sharing might not be a useful tool. Despite the fact that you have thousands of people who have made papers in this area and this potential application, because if the, the secret is not, if the shares are not used or not, the secret is not reconstructed, then it is useless. So, my co author, Slinko, uh, he had objections against the aforementioned conclusion, and he claimed that what they had done was sometimes unrealistic. And so he claimed that the conclusion of rational secret sharing only applies to situation where all parties are adversarial, such as the case of sharing a map of a treasure. So 
There are very interesting stories that happen uh, when you look at uh, how America was conquered from the uh, what people used to call the American Indians. Uh, and so one of the things that happened there is that there was a part of the French army that was actually fighting the American Indians. And they were going to be taken over. So they decided to bury a lot of gold. It's still worth several millions of dollars, which they just buried. Clear? So now, what happens? Suppose you make a map of that place where you bury it, and I give you a share and you a share. Okay? So now you're here in uh, Australia. But well, Trump sometimes goes to the USA. So now, you see, in the United States, are you going to reveal your share to him? Because what he may do, he may run to the place once he gets your share and then know where this gold is and dig it up. Clear? So that's irrational for you to give it to a person who is in the USA when you're far away from the USA. Because he will get there first and he will get all the gold. Clear for everybody? So that's the argument. Basically, in such a scenario, revealing your share is irrational. Okay. And so, what after uh, my co author Slinko uh, uh, talked with me about it, we looked at what are potential applications of secret share. Okay. And so, we considered a few scenarios. The first scenario is authorizing a project. So the secret may give access to a bank account from the city. Uh, and so the, the parties then are the, the city council. And so the common good would be using the, uh, the funds to build, for example, a new tube line or whatever uh, that you have. In uh, Melbourne, they're actually building a new train line that's going to go underground. And so that was authorized by as a project, and then the whole city or part of the city at least will benefit from it's not a tube line, but it is an underground train. So the, the concept of common good is actually quite old and it goes back to Aristotle, who considered which considered the part of the concept of common good, something that benefits society. So launching a nuclear missile is something that does not benefit in society. Okay. So in the U former USSR, any two of three top state officials were needed to activate their nuclear suitcases to launch a missile. And so in that case, the common good is to defeat an enemy. So I put good between quotes because usually both people don't regard a nuclear war as uh, a good. But uh, if you look from their viewpoint, and you look at defeating an enemy, that, that might be the common good. So in threshold cryptography, you could have signing a message, or one of the original applications of the message would be signed on behalf of an organization, says the city council. Okay, now some notes is some parties may decide not to go sign, but that's if they are against, that's not because they think that they are adversaries. No, they think that actually the city project should not take place. And so they do not go sign some proposal if they think it's not in the interest of the organization. Okay. Now, note that in central control and in NPC, the secret should not be recovered. They actually are huge. So what we then basically did is we modeled a realistic secret sharing where we assign to a party PI of value NI when the common good is achieved. Okay, so if you have this train now that's going to go underground in Melbourne, then people living in that neighborhood have a, a good that actually will be for them. And then the people who are on the city council, they are more likely to be elected. So that means that every part of the city council will have an NI life people than zero. So when you are participating, then there is a cost uh, to participate. In the case of the gold, in your case, this is a huge cost because you will lose all the gold. Clear? I mean, your share of the gold. 
But so in other cases, as in your city council, the cost to participate is actually quite low. And so what we now distinguish is that if the cost to participate is higher than actually the common good, which would be the case in communal goal, then the best strategy is not to participate. However, if the opposite is the case, then for the minimal authorized coalition of the access sector, participation is a winning strategy. And so for more details about the game theory aspect of that, I'm referring you to reference three. So here's the sharing. I'm going to go very quickly. It's basically a polynomial, which is secret. Uh, you're going to get a part of the polynomial if you are a shareholder, and the secret is put at value x equal to zero. And to construct it, you're going to use uh, Lagrange interpolation. So now there is actually a problem with the mere secret sharing scheme that many people actually don't realize, which I call a dual common LEP parties cannot only recompute the secret K, but they can find the shares of all the other participants. So that means that what that now means is that, uh, for example, you could have shares of a legal will. And that means that you will actually now you could evaluate that you could read the rule prior to the death of the person and you could blame others for that because what you will do so it's suppose again you do share a document but this time a will so what you will do is you will just say the two of you don't only recompute the secrets but also recompute the the, the whole polynomial and since you know the whole polynomial you can then compute the shares of other people, let's say these two here, okay? And then you will pretend that these shares were used. And so if everything is then traced, you will, these two people will be blamed for having illegally opened the will. Clear? So if you are a city council, so you could decide to co-sign a financial transaction that should not have been authorized. Again, you can blame the others because you can recompute. Their shares. Also, if you look at threshold decryption, you can co-decrypt a document without share and decryption with the other n minus t parties. And uh, you can compute xi with the participant pi in situ multi-party computation. Okay. Which I think is a very, very, very serious problem because what happens if you think about secure multi-party computation, everybody says share everything, share all your data. Yeah, but that assumes that you are very correct about your estimation of the threshold. If you think that five people should be the threshold, then that means that if you are a very important person and you're going to share all your data, then yeah, that may not be the case. Okay. So, for example, let's take a complete example. In the United States, there is uh, Donald Trump who now has been forced to have all his tax uh, records be made available to Congress. So now, if you make here a five out of, uh, in, the, in the Senate, there are 50 people. Let's take the Senate as the easiest. Uh, there are 100 uh, people in the Senate, every state has two senators. So if you have five out of 100, you only need five people to basically work together in order to find all the secrets that are in. Trump's uh, tax record. They're confidential, but it's not so difficult to leak something. And now, what these people will do, they will blame the others because they have recomputed the share of the others. So, again, it's these guys who are blamed, while in fact, it was somebody else who did that. So, therefore, you don't have uh, the so when you look at digital forensics, you can apply digital forensics because other people will be blamed. So you can frame other participants. So it's rather trivial for sharing a ticket share. But the question then is, if you look at other access structures, if you think about that idea, uh, then what can you actually conclude? And so one topic that was introduced by Simmons in 1988 and, and made formal by, by Faraz and Pablo, was the seniority of participants and so what uh the way it was formalized is say when you have an access structure of a certain secret sharing scheme we now define the relation of that secret sharing scheme 
uh, by setting uh, so on B by saying that B is larger than Q or more powerful than Q. If, if you have X union Q belonging to the access structure, and then it implies that if you take Q out and you put B in there, that then it will also belong to the access structure. And that for every set X that's basically separate from P that doesn't contain P and Q. So that means that B is more powerful than Q. Okay. So if you have a quality, then it becomes, if you also allow a quality, it means that it is at least as powerful as Q in the relation. So this is very also known in game theory. So this concept is older. Uh, and in game theory, this is called Isbell's desirability relation. And it is related to formal coalition. And so that means that you would either rather have coalition with P than one with Q because P is more powerful. All of these are powerful. Okay, so. What is ideal CP chair? I mentioned that earlier on. It's perfect, but also the size of each chair must be the same as the size of the CP. So then we have a theorem that says the following Let uh, this be an access structure of an ideal CP chairing scheme, and let X be an authorized coalition containing a participant B, which is contained in some minimal authorized sub coalition of X. Now suppose that A is at least as powerful as B because of A not belonging to X, then X can frame A. Okay? So the more power you have, the easier you can be framed. Okay? This is not really, really great because it means that if you're, for example, the Prime Minister of Australia, you're the person of Australia with the most power, you're the easiest to frame. Clear? Okay. So let's now look at the hierarchical secret sharing schemes. I heard the secret sharing schemes, I'm not going to talk about the history of them, they have an interesting history. So, some examples the significant sum of money is being transferred from a bank to another bank, and approval may require approval of two vice presidents or three senior fellows, or a vice president and two senior fellows. Okay. Another example is 15 members of the UN Security Council consists of five permanent. And then non permanent countries. A passage or resolution requires approval of at least nine countries, subject to a, vote, a veto by any of the one permanent countries. Okay. So now I'm going to go to a formal definition of hierarchical architecture. You have two the one is uh, disjunctive, the other one is constructive. So you're going to have, so suppose you have a bunch of participants. Uh, P0, we'll talk about what P0 is later, partition into empty disjoint subsets. Uh, and now we let K1 be less than K2, less than KM, a sequence of positive integers. Those are basically the levels in the hierarchy. So now we define a disjunctive hierarchical access structure by setting a set of authorized coalitions to be such that uh, there exists an I. For which, if you take x and you take the intersection with the union of p i's, it's going to be larger or equal than uh, the k i and exist one. Now, if you go to the conjunctive hierarchical access structure, this no longer exists, and it's for all. And then you can see that the first example can be achieved the one in which you had the bank where you could make sure if you have no reliability, the disjunctive, this is this disjunctive hierarchical uh, scheme with k equal to two and three. And the other one is a conjunctive one where you have k equal to five and nine. Okay, so these hierarchical access vectors appear quite normal in real life. So now I'm going to take examples of sharing. Now what happens if you talk to people who are in a combinatorial area, they look at secret sharing scheme very differently than people who are basically typically look at using an algebra. And what they do is they put here the secret. And so this is the share of the first participant share, the second share, the third share, the fourth. And then they have here a zero. And what they will do when you look at the integers of three, you will have a linear combination of those. Okay. So now you can see what that zero means, and now you can see why 
P0. What is P0? P0 is a dealer. Yeah. For so the way they look at it, it's a half P0, and that's a dealer. And so now what we see is that P1 and P2. So what you know will have to have multiply this with a T. Uh, I think I call that T1 or T0, but doesn't matter. Okay, let's call it T1 and this T2. So in order to reconstruct the secret, you have to find a, a linear combination of those rows that gives you one and zero. Okay. So, in other words, if you think algebraically, that to that course, the first uh, column corresponds to the secret, and that's the randomness. And so then that's the secret. Right? So, if you look at P1 and P2, and you're working on the integers four or three, then you see that if you take this one and you subtract that one, that one can will cancel out. So, if you look at H1 and H2, you take H1 minus H2. Uh, that that one cancels out and you will be able to get the secret. If you look at part three and part four, they too can recover the secret. And how can you do that? Uh, okay, let's not look at P2, uh, P, uh, P3 and P4. Okay, so now what we have is that if you look at a, pa a participant p1 and p2 as you see they write them with small uh, uh, lowercase instead of uppercase as we do and uppercase ones stand for subsets so if you look at uh, the uh, little p1 little p2 participants then they will also know p3 and they will also know p4 so indeed, because if you look at H3, H3 is nothing else than H1 plus H2, which you can verify by looking at the row uh, that has H1, and then looking at the row which H2 add them up, and then you will overlook three, and you basically are going to get H3. Clear, so they can get that share. And similarly, they can also obtain H4. Okay, so now there's a further reflection is that actually uh, P4 is a clone of uh, P3. And cloning of candidates is a well known phenomenon in voting. Okay, so I found it out when I was rerunning for uh, being on the board of directors of IACR. I was too outspoken on the board, and so people didn't like me. So, what did they do? The year that I was running or rerunning for being re-elected, they went to Joseph and said to Joseph, you should run. They also went to Ray Safapinani and they should tell told her you should run. So now the people who would usually vote for me, they, their vote was split in three. They would vote either for Joseph or for uh, the Ray or for me. And so I was not re-elected. So that's called cloning. It's well known. And Gunnar said, a French scientist a long time ago invented this. Okay, so people in the, in the social science know this very, very, very well. Cryptographers don't. Okay. So, what well, if you look here, you see that H4 is nothing else than a clone of H3, because if you do here minus one over the integer model three from H3, you get H4. Okay, so the reason P3 and P4 can be framed by X is that X is not the weakest of the coalition as P2 can be replaced by P3, which is weaker, and still we have P1, P3 authorized. Okay. And so it's important to actually understand that, and that led to the following concept. So yeah, if you have an access structure and you will let this be a coalition, if P belongs to X and X does not belong to, to and Q, sorry, does not belong to X. Then with P slightly larger with that relation I explained earlier than Q, then passing from X to X minus P, so you remove P who is a member, and you replace it by Q, it's said to be shift of X. And so an authorized collision, X is said to be shift minimal authorized 
so if first any shape of x is not totalized and do any shape of x is not totalized either. Okay, so this is an example of a uh, shift uh, minimal. So we consider a linear shift secret chain scheme. If the line will be consistent, so again, the secret is here, and then this will have random R1 and the random R2. If you look from an algebraic viewpoint, so the minimal organized coalitions are P1, P2, P1, P3, P4, P2, P3, P4. So as an example one, there are two graphs of equivalent participants, P1, P2, and uh, P3, P4, with the first being more senior than the second. However, this time P1, P2 is a shift minimal coalition, authorized coalition. So now suppose the random vector T0, T1, T2 was used to generate the shares, then participant one and two will be able to write. So if you look at participant one and two, it's very interesting because their share does not depend on this, the last randomness. Clear? So that means that they can indeed recover the seeker, but they cannot find the third chair or the fourth chair because they don't, from this data, they cannot find what the third randomness is. Safe for everybody? Okay. So they will be unable to calculate D2, and so therefore, because it's not part of their equation, and hence S3 and S4, they can also not compute. On the other hand, P1, P3, and P4 will be able to complete. Compute calculate D0, D1, D2, and then it's S2. If D3 were to be there, okay. then check that P1, P3, P4. We look at P1, P3, P4. Then if you look at this, uh, the, the determinant of that three by three matrix, uh, you can see that it basically is not zero. There's an easy way. So, okay, if I subtract that the, uh, H1 from H3, then this will give me 0, 0, 1. Then I can subtract that uh, 0, 0, 1, 4 times from H4. Then I will have 1, 2, 0, and then you need to see that there is more. Clear? So you can recover everything. And so, therefore, you can frame the other parts. Okay, and similarly, P2, P3, P4, which I will not explain, will be able to calculate as well. Okay, so now we have a theorem that K, this P, this term that I introduced earlier. And suppose that radical axis structure is either uh, the conjunctive or disjunctive, uh, disjunctive or conjunctive, uh, and at back time. Then what we have is that any minimal shift authorized coalition of I type can frame every participant from I and higher not belong to it and cannot frame any participants from levels I plus one and uh, uh, till M. And so if it's the uh, other one, then any shift minimal authorized coalition can frame every participant not belonging to it. So again, the more the higher you are in the hierarchy, the uh, easier your frame, okay. which is kind of not what you want in real life. Okay. So you could say this is this advantage of having ideal sharing scheme. Yeah, you can regard it as that because it falls automatically from that. So there's a lot of there's a lot of conclusions and a lot of uh, over problems. It's in the main examples of framing non-ideal scheme. I did that and made many of those, uh, but we decided not to put them in the paper. And one of the reasons is, is that so in that case, if you are non-ideal, one of the participants or more may receive two or more shares to be used depending on the authorized coalition. Sorry, folks. 
Can you hear me again? Sorry. Yeah. I lost my microphone. And so this makes the issue of framing more complex in the sense that certain participants might be partially framed for one of the shares, but not the others. Clear? Now it's still interesting, I think, because that means that if you can partially frame a person, that means that oops, that goes again. How come that before as in the Maybe I'll find a better way of taking this in. Doesn't have a clip. Or... No, it doesn't have a clip. Uh, yeah. It's a modern Have version. you put it in the pocket? The what? Put it in your pocket. Okay. So uh, now people cannot hear me anymore. What about what? now? Do you want to use this? Sorry, folks. Uh, Hello. Yeah, it's on. Hello. Yes, awesome. So this, uh, I think it's an interesting to look at not only a secret sharing scheme. So if you can partially frame a party, that means that that party with a certain coalition, you can still frame that. So you can still frame some coalition. But not every coalition in which a party is going to be in. Clear? So, in that sense. Uh, so, yes, I think there should be more that being done on this. The problem uh, also is that there's a lot of game theory which is known. So, uh, one of the things my co author did is make a link between game theory. Other people did a little bit about that before, uh, made a link between game theory. And secret sharing, other, uh, in particular, we're looking at ideal secret sharing schemes. So, for non ideal secret sharing, there is less, there are less tools available today. I mean, it might, might, might make it interesting for uh, people to try to look at new tools to be used for secret sharing and to analyze them. So, except for rational secret sharing and its variants, the cryptographic community lacks to consider game theory and social sciences. And so it was nice to actually work with a person whose background, uh, I mean, whose papers are in social sciences primarily, because they look at things from a very different viewpoint. And uh, so if you look at rational secret sharing, then the question is, that brings in uh, the game theory. And so then we actually said, hey, we can, we can, look, we look, at, can look at framing and framing of secret sharing has been considered. So, but what else can we frame people in? And so if you want crypto to be used more, then we should look at in what other context can one frame? And so I think that we should work more with people in social sciences and see what other aspects that we are missing. Uh, that's one of the problems that our community has is that we are very isolated. You could say we have hundreds of conferences today. Yes, it's true. There are more crypto conferences today than there are weeks in the year. So probably we are 100 today, workshops included. Okay. And so, but it's always the same community. It's not that we going to people outside our community and say, okay, can you help us with that? Or can you help us with that? Very few people are actually doing that. And if we were to do that more, then what happens is that we may actually get to interesting top, uh, topics that, Today are not being studied. So I'm now going to give you the references. So the uh, paper about framing and secret sharing uh, uh, appeared in IT Transactional Information, Forensics, and Security, which at the, the year it got published added 
uh, its ISI ranking was eight. Okay, which is very, very high for ISI ranking. The other uh, paper about realistic personal national secret sharing appeared in uh, Decision and Game Theory for Security, which was a 10th international conference called GameSec 2019. Uh, most people there are actually from the gaming community. Uh, and so that appeared in the uh, lecture notes in computer science from Springer. Now there's another one. Uh, what's that reference? So when we submitted the paper, I told my co-author, I said, you know, the uh, uh, the IDP transaction information in forensics is read by people who are usually in forensics. And so they don't know all the math. And so we should try to simplify uh, the uh, paper as much as possible. And so if you look in the literature, and if you look at people who use it, this notation, the one that I, I had where you put this extra row here, uh, they basically use metroid theory. Okay. So I told my co-author, I said, you know, nobody in that transaction knows metroids. Now what happened is that when I submitted the paper, we got assigned an editor, and that editor had not her PhD using matroids. And so she then asked other people who also knew about matroids to actually refer the paper. And they said, this is all the proof that now two pages become half a page if you use matroids. And so they said, these proofs are too long. They're easy to read, but they are too long. And so therefore they said, we need to you must use matroids. So now we have an unreadable paper for people who don't know matroids. Uh, so yes, we have an unreadable paper uh, for people who don't know matroids. Most leaders here don't know matroids. And the ones which is readable no, didn't get published. So if I find the time, maybe it will be 2023 during the, uh, the New Year break, I will actually upload uh the to the archive the uh, version with easy proof so then the paper becomes more easily accessible any questions yes thank you <laughs> yeah any questions for you mm -hmm. Okay, so yes, for this framing, how could you how could you prevent it? Framing, maybe you can use a very viable sequencing scheme. So one thing that we talked about is using authentication. So that when you do sharing, okay. you also authenticate uh your share, so you have a secret key and then yeah. uh but verifiable will not help. Verifiable will just say, look, that the share that you got. Corresponds with the share that other people got. Mm -hmm. Clear? So, in that sense. But can we, I mean, because here the framing attack is by the authorized uh, parties of the access. Obviously. So, can't we, can't we define another access structure for framing that we want to defend against the, those um, subsets? It would be nice. I think, yes, it would be really, really nice that. Uh, some new research is done on this. And I mean, since the fact that this appeared in a journal with such a high uh, ISI ranking, we hope that people will follow up on the work. But I think this is a really great idea. Uh, if you have people, students or so, who are looking for topics, yeah. that's a really nice topic, uh, and a nice approach to define uh, basically. An adversarial, yeah, an adversarial, an, yes, structure. an adversarial structure yeah. uh, that prevents you from framing, yeah, and then see what you can do. But it, it's going to be non-ideal. Yeah. Okay. But but how about using? I mean, because 
we can also try to defend against some of this framing by having external mechanisms. Like for example, if each of the parties uh, has a signing key that- Yes, that's what right? I, is the paper. That approach is the paper. Oh, okay. Yes. yes. But using extra, uh, you give the participants secret keys. Yeah. And then- Which cannot be recovered them. by the others. Yes, okay. yes. Yeah. Okay. But if you think, think about the algebra which should be used, so for example, if you talk about threshold crypto, that's not part. Okay. So if you look at this here, so there's some cryptography you should mention here, then you need to adapt that so that you can, which makes it bigger. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's no longer that you're just going to have the signature coming out. You now have to have kind of a lock also. Yeah. A signed lock. Yeah. Yeah. And also it may make uh, make it more difficult to have uh, anonymity if you want also anonymity for like if you have to sign uh, when you do something, you, you you have to do it in a way that doesn't reveal who you are, but then you may need to use some kind of Anonymous signing or yeah. There are lots of great ideas what you propose, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of follow up uh, to investigate, yeah. and I think all very nice topics. Uh, okay, yeah. So yeah, so this area is quite so my PhD student actually worked on anonymous secret sharing. And so one thing that I pointed out to him immediately is that. Uh, when Christian German visited me in Milwaukee, we were actually working on anonymous secret sharing. And one of the things that we pointed out is that Simpson's paper that he put, in which they describe anonymous secret sharing is not truly anonymous. Okay, so be very careful. And unfortunately for Christian, uh, some people published his results without actually putting him as a co-author. So uh, the work on making anonymous secret sharing truly anonymous. That was in the PhD from Christian German who visited me. And we were planning to write a paper on that. And so these people did not, they, they basically acknowledged his PhD, et cetera, but they didn't include him at all. So if you look at anonymous secret sharing, you should read the right literature, not the one from Simpson. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Because right. Simpson definition is no good. <laughs> Okay, yeah. So what Stinson definition said, I mentioned since I mentioned on stone, you remember also Stinson was part of that paper. So what they try to do is to remove this excess. Uh, and when you remove the excess, they call that on the signature. But that's not true because you will still be able to find out <laughs> who the other if you use the share. You will still be able to find out that the other participants will be able to find who it was, yeah. and so therefore it's not really anonymous. Uh, okay. Yeah. okay yeah. But yes, yeah, it's, it's a nice topic. Uh, how can you make frame proof and at the same time uh, anonymous yeah. secret sharing, yeah. uh, so that you can guarantee that indeed the people who used it are, are not framing. Uh, but this, isn't it a contradiction? Yeah, it seems to be, yeah. But yeah, a lot of things in crypto are actually contradictions or look to be contradictions, but they're done yeah, maybe, paradoxes. Yeah, yeah, a lot of things can be solved with the right uh, approach. With the right tools, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. So yeah, I think it's, uh, yeah, it would be really, really nice to uh, try to see how to address these problems and to extend it, etc. So, all right, yeah. Any other questions? Or... I don't think we have any questions online. Um, no, maybe Adam. Yeah. Okay, you have questions. Good. Yeah. I think you were thanks for the talk, so I'm trying to see uh, the message panel here. Uh, so, between my work is not too much about crypto, but more cyber security side. Uh -huh. I'm just wondering uh, is there any solution that can, uh, sorry, sorry, it's not solution, can any possible that can swing the data as well uh, and can 
big solution you can give this uh, training on dealer. So why would you frame the dealer? Um, so my question here is I consider the kind of uh, edge and infection scheme that currently we have. And if the, the center, so it can be the dealer, the dealer was uh, sharing something to the edge and infection scheme uh -huh. and the recipient will give that back. And uh, in our case, so if you consider some kind of uh, moderation or the, um, uh, some computation during over the server, and the recipient can say the center of you sending something that was harmful. For example, you sending some virus to me, and then it force the center to rebel this thing to, to the server, to the server to deal with the secure communication. Yeah, so the fact that the recipient, they collaborate with the people who, the player with the secure communication scheme, okay. and then it's just frame the data. So if the data is sending something that is not, uh, good, not good thing, just a virus, then it just rebound this kind of thing to the player of the safety competition. Uh, so, okay, let me ask you. So, first of all, we don't know how to, to prevent this frame. Okay, so yeah. how would I then be able to answer your question, which is more complex? Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, so but this is again a nice question. One thing I wanted to tell you so, I thought everybody here would know about secret sharing. Uh, and so one thing that I want to tell for the people who are actually from cybersecurity, which I did skip, <clears throat> is that this is very different, as I said here, this is very different from actually controlling computer security. So if you think about the way that we run up think versus the way that computer security people, if you think about access control in computer security, I also teach computer security, or I use at least. So what happens there is that you when you say, these people have access. Let's say, for example, it's taking in Ron and Roshan have access in computer security. That means that both of you have full access to the document. Yeah. So, well, if you think about secret sharing, then you need both. And that has huge implications in the sense that if you think about highly classified documents, if you use computer security approach, that means that Rob by himself can read a whole document and so can more wrong in computer security. While in crypto, this is not the case. And so I think that the crypto, the computer security community should take some inspiration from, from, I think, uh, from the crypto community and see how to adapt that in computer security so that the security goes up and it becomes much more difficult because in that case, if you think, for example, about Snowden. So Snowden leaked all these documents. Okay, it turned out only 2% got published. Okay. Uh, so if you, depending from which newspaper you read, only 2% got published, 3% got published, like one of the other one. And the British Secret Service was able to basically, they're not called Secret Service, but uh, MI5, I think, whatever. They were able to shut down all the other ones, and they told the Guardian that if they published the rest, they were going to go to jail. Okay, so freedom of press is not what people think. Okay. So, but if you look from the viewpoint of the government, the Snowden leak was a really bad leak. So now, if you do not give Snowden access using the computer security approach, but you need another person to be there in order to read the document, then the Snowden leak wouldn't have been possible. Yeah. So that's, I think, for the computer security community, quite important to stop using what they're using now and switch to a very different approach. So I hope that comment is useful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for the comments. Okay. So, um, yeah, if there's no other uh, questions or comments, then, um, yeah, let's thank. Uh, I, I thank uh, you for inviting me. I also thank you for uh, allowing me to give a talk. I would, it's actually me who would like to thank you. <laughs> yes, thank you. We can thank both uh, in both directions. <laughs> so, um, yes, yeah, so, and thank you for everyone uh, joining us today. Um, I hope you uh, enjoyed the talk and um, we'll resume our uh, seminars uh, in this series next year. So I hope to see you there. Bye-bye. Uh, I need to...